that you often get lines, like two lines together, and the first line helps you make sense of the second, and the second likewise helps you understand what the first is all about. So when you see Psalm 73, verse 3, and you read arrogant and wicked, those two words can help us interpret, can help interpret each other. In other words, wickedness in the Bible is often compared to arrogance. And what is arrogance? Well, arrogance is really sort of self-reliance. I don't need anybody. I can do this myself. I'm self-sufficient. And maybe even if you flesh that out a little more, you begin to see that it's also a sense that I'm not accountable to anybody. I can do whatever I'd like, and there aren't consequences for me. Who's going to challenge me? Who's going to tell me I'm wrong? Who's going to push back against me? In fact, if you look at verses 6 through 9, you begin to see how this the psalmist kind of unpacks this. Pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. Then he goes on, and out of this comes callous hearts and iniquity, evil conceits. They scoff. They speak with malice. In their arrogance, they threaten oppression. And here's a key verse. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. That's a, that's a boasting of great arrogance. They lay claim to heaven, and they, um, they, they take hold of the earth. They take possession of the earth. That's arrogance. I can do what I want, whenever I want, however I want. It's all for me. Um, you go a little further down in verse 11. Here's, here's the maybe another very descriptive uh, sentence here. How, they say, how can God know? Does the Most High have knowledge? Right. Who's going to stop me? I can do whatever I want, and what, is God going to put an end to it? You know, if you go back and, and pay attention to some of the major stories, and maybe let's say even the last five, ten years or so, whether it's in business or politics or entertainment, some of these headline-making stories, you'll, you'll read of stories of, of executives who believe that they could do whatever they wanted to exploit their workers, no matter how illegal or immoral it was, they could take advantage of people and it was all for personal gain. I'm thinking of stories like Bernie Madoff. And if you read some of the accounts of his, what he did, you'll hear, he says, well, I thought I, I, thought I could get away with it. Or the Me Too movement. Powerful people who believe they could treat those under them however they wanted and who's going to stop me? It's that arrogance that says I can do what I want and no one will put an end to it. And then out of that flows all of the action, the malice, the oppression, the violence. When you believe that you are a law unto yourself, there are no limits to what you will do. Now those are big examples but you've probably run into these on a smaller scale. Maybe it's another kid at school who bullies and picks on kids. And what are you going to tell the teacher? What's the teacher going to do about it? Who's going to stop me? Maybe it's someone that you work with. They're saying, you know, we can fudge the numbers. Who's ever going to catch us? Who's going to tell us to stop? Now that's bad enough, but it gets worse. Look with me, if you will, at verse, starting in verse 4. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. So here they are. You've got people who believe they can do whatever they want. No one's ever going to catch them. And they're healthy. They're strong. They seem to be living the good life. If you go into verse 5, they're free from the burdens common to man. They're not plagued by human ills. Right? Why is it that their cars never break down? Their furnace never goes out. They never have to go to the doctor and find out what's wrong with them and hear bad news from the doctor. They actually seem to be living really well. Life seems to be really good for them. It doesn't seem fair. In fact, verse 12, not only are they free from the ills common to man, but in verse 12, they're always carefree and they increase in wealth. It's not fair. The people who take advantage of others 
are actually prospering because of it. Their, bank, their, their stock portfolio is increasing. They get to buy nicer and bigger houses and fancier cars, and they take more exotic vacations. And it gets worse yet. Look at verse 13. You didn't hear this first read this morning, but take a look. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. In vain I've washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been plagued. I have been punished every morning. In some ways that's maybe the worst part of the whole uh, experience. Because here you are, you're trying to be honest in the work that you do. You're trying to be a person of integrity. You're not going to fudge the numbers. You're not going to pad your expense account. You're not going to cheat on the test. They don't get caught, and your grades are suffering. You're not landing the account. You're not making the sale. You're getting passed over for promotion. So why be good? Really? What's the point in trying to be a person of integrity and righteousness? What's the point of trying to live by God's word if those who don't live by God's word are wealthy and successful and prosperous and they never seem to get caught? Why try to be good? What's the point? You get the sense of, of the, the tension that the psalmist feels in all of this. Not only do the bad people not get caught, but they get away with it, they succeed because of it, and the good people, they're the ones that pay the price. Dwell on this, as the psalmist did for a bit, and it will make you bitter. Look at verse 16. When I tried to all understand all of this, it was oppressive to me. I spend a lot of time dwelling on this and keeping score. Who's succeeding and who's not? Who's getting ahead and who's not? It's going to create deep bitterness in your heart. It starts to become oppressive. A little later on, the psalmist compares himself to a brute beast. I became animalistic in front of you. Angry. You know, try to put an animal in a pen or a stall that doesn't want to be there, and they start to get really agitated, and they kick, and they do all the other things that animals do. Most of you are probably more familiar with that even than I am, but you get the picture. That's what the psalmist says. This is making him bitter. It's causing a crisis of faith for him. That's why he says, my foot almost slipped. I looked at the world around me and everything that I thought about what was just and right and fair and how the world should operate according to these principles of righteousness and justice, all of that suddenly proved to not be the case and I almost slipped. My foot almost slipped and I almost came crashing down. That's a crisis of faith. It almost drove me away from God. But something happened. Something happened to change all of that. Verse 17. This is the pivot point, the hinge in the whole psalm. It's after, psalm, after verse 17 that the psalmist changes. See things differently. So before, brute beast, foot slipping, injustice, the world's not fair, verse 17, and then after, ah, things began to make more sense. So what's verse 17? It's key. Look at it. Till I entered the sanctuary of God. Till I entered the sanctuary of God. What does that mean? Well, the sanctuary was the place of worship. The sanctuary was the place where God's people went to encounter and to experience the presence of God. It's interesting to note the psalm was written, the psalm of Asaph. Asaph was one of the worship leaders in Israel. The Asaph and the so in all likelihood the psalmist has very clear understanding of what it means to enter the presence of God. The psalmist is saying that when we encounter and experience the presence of God, it completely transforms us, completely changes how we see the world. Just a little side note, although I think it's actually not so much of a side note, but a little bit. This lets us know that being a Christian is not just about 
doctrinal or theological knowledge. It's not just about discovering answers, biblical answers to questions. And neither is it just an ethical thing, like being a Christian is about living according to these certain rules and principles. Being a Christian is an encounter with the presence of God. Through Christ, we are drawn into the presence of God in a way that completely changes us. Now that's really important because biblically, there are a number of times where we read of people who actually get near to the presence of God. You think of, say, Moses, and you think of Elijah, and you think of the prophet um, Isaiah in the temple. And every single time a person gets near to the presence of God, it nearly destroys them because the holiness and the majesty and the awesomeness and the power of God are so great and so overwhelming that broken and fallen and sinful and ordinary people can't stand in his presence without it consuming them. Isaiah the prophet says, Woe to me, I am undone. He knows that he, unless something dramatic happens, it's going to completely destroy him. To be a Christian is to have an encounter with the presence of God. Now, the Christmas message, the Christmas story, shows us how this happens. Because being a Christian isn't about, let's see if I can do enough things to climb up so I can experience the presence of God. Being a Christian is not, what can I do to sort of manufacture the presence of God in my own life? Being a Christian is about recognizing that God in all of his glory and all of his majesty and all of his splendor and his holiness and his righteousness comes down to us in the flesh. And it's in that little baby born in a stable in Bethlehem that the presence of God comes to us. Now what happens when you and I experience and encounter Jesus? How does an, account, an encounter with the presence of Jesus change you and me? The psalmist points us to three ways. Um, <clears throat> three ways that, that encountering God's presence in Christ will change us. Look at verse 18. Surely you place them, that's the wicked, on slippery ground. That's clever that's really clever wordplay because remember, who was on slippery ground at first? The psalmist. My foot almost slipped. My perception about the way that I thought the world should operate turned out to be wrong and it almost it was a crisis of faith. But then he sees, now I see that the people on slippery ground are the wicked. Which is a way of saying, you know, arrogant people think that they're a law unto themselves. They think they'll never get caught. They think there's nothing in this world that can harm them. They'll get away with it always. And what the psalmist says is, they're on they're on slippery ground. Their perception about the world is wrong. Their perception of the world is going to give way. And he goes on in, in verses 19 and 20, and he acknowledges how suddenly they are destroyed. In other words, God will not, God will not allow evil to go unchecked. God sees and knows the presence and the power of sin and the destructive effects of sin. He sees what people try to get away with in this world and his commitment is to deal with it justly, to address it, to punish it. Now look, there's a part in, in I think almost all of us that wants to object to that at least a little bit. And particularly if Christianity is, is something new to you and you hear Christians talking about God going to judge and punish and you might be thinking to yourself, this is the problem I have with Christianity. But don't you see, every last one of us recognizes injustice in this world. We recognize evil and it cuts us right to the very core of our being when people get away with evil. We want evil to be punished. When those in power and those with wealth exploit and take advantage of people, there's something about us that says, that's not right. When a person is let off the hook for a crime that they've committed and they get out on a technicality, 
You say, that's not right. When we see violence and injustice in our communities, when we see, um, when we see the effects of sin in our world, we say, that's not right. And the message of the gospel is that God intends to deal with evil. In fact, um, one of the passages, one of the stories we often hear around, read around this time of year is the story of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was, was sent as a forerunner to Jesus to prepare the world for the coming of the Savior. And John the Baptist, lots of people are flocking to hear him preach and they want to hear his message. And John calls out the people, he says, those of you who are guilty of evil and violence, repent because judgment is coming. In other words, one of the things Jesus intends to do by coming to this world is to deal with the presence of evil. And John says, you need to get ready for that. And if you recognize, he's speaking in, in John, um, in, in the early Gospels, he speaks to soldiers and he speaks to tax collectors and he speaks to people who are singled out, especially for being those who practiced um, sin and injustice and violence. He says, repent, because God is going to judge sin. Now here's the thing. Advent season recognizes that Jesus came into this world and it recognizes that Jesus will come again and when he comes again, he will bring justice once and for all. He will bring judgment. But in the meantime, there's the call to you and to me to repent. God has made a way that we might, instead of experiencing justice, that we might receive mercy and pardon. God will deal with evil. But at the cross, he's also made a way for us to experience mercy and forgiveness so that the justice that we deserve won't fall on us because it has already fallen on Jesus. That's the first thing the psalmist begins to realize, that God will cast them down to ruin. He will deal with evil in the world, and he's done so at the cross. The second thing he begins to realize is that life is measured in eternity and not in temporality. In other words, we have to look at life as something that is eternal. It's not limited by time. Um, earlier on, the psalmist says, you know, I, I looked at the wicked and they, they were living high on the hog. They were wealthy. They were happy. They seemed to be having the good life. Now, why don't, you know, I'm not experiencing any of that. It's not fair. But what the psalmist begins to see, look at verse 24. You guide me with your counsel and afterward you will take me into glory. Right, those who are, well, let's sit with that for a moment. Afterwards, you will take me into glory. The psalmist recognizes that even in this life, we may experience pain and we may experience what looks like injustice, but afterward, in other words, there is an eternity. You know, Bertrand Russell, the, the well-known British um, atheist, scholar, um, essayist, mathematician of the last century, he said this, and in a way this is insightful. He says, you know, Happiness is only happiness because it ends. The only reason you can be happy now is because there's a limit. He even says after this life you're going to just be put in the ground and that's the end of you. So you might as well just be happy now. And there's one sense in which he's kind of right about that because he's recognizing if you look at the world only in terms of this life, then, then this is all you've got. This is as good as it gets. But that's not a biblical way of looking at the world. Biblically, the psalmist says, there is eternity ahead. And we have to look at life not just in terms of how do we live in the here and now, but what does life look like in light of eternity. The psalmist goes on, he says, My heart and my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. What is he saying? My heart and my flesh may fail. The very things that we count on, some of the key things that are key to us, our health, our bodies will fail, our bodies will give out, our minds will fail, our minds will give out in this life, but in eternity, well, we will live forever. We will be resurrected to new, perfect bodies without aches and pains and suffering and sickness and disease and death. So if you only measure life by what you see in the here and now, you're not getting the full picture. You have to look at eternity. John writes in his gospel that Jesus came into this world. Why? so that we may have life and have it in abundance, so that we may have life eternal. That's why Jesus came. 
That's why eternity entered into our temporal world so that we might then live with him for eternity. Jesus comes to bring life for eternity. So those, there's the first two things that the psalmist begins to see and the way he looks at the world differently. The first, God will deal with evil. The second, we have to measure life in terms of eternity. And the third is this, God is sufficient. God is enough. Seek God for who he is, not for what he can do. Psalmist recognizes the fatal flaw in his earlier way of thinking. He looks around at the world and he says, look at all this. It was all the, the bad people, they get ahead. And here I am, it was vain. In vain I was trying to live a good life. There's no point to being a good person. Why seek after God if you're going to suffer nonetheless? And the psalmist realizes the fatal flaw in that thinking, which is, I was just seeking after God for what God could do for me. I wanted to seek God so that I could have a life that was free from trouble and hurt and pain and suffering and difficulty. That's why I was seeking after God. That's what the psalmist says. That's why I was a brute beast. That's why my foot almost slipped, because I was seeking God for what he could do and not for who he is. That's why the psalmist says in, in verse 23, he now realizes, yet I am always with you. You hold me with your right hand. Verse 25, whom have I in heaven but you, and earth has nothing I desire besides you. You hear what he's saying there? No matter what happens to me, I may suffer in this world. I may lose my health. I may lose my, all my material possessions. My life may be filled with pain and suffering, but God is enough. He is sufficient. Don't seek after God for what God can do for you as if he's some cosmic butler. Seek after him for who he is because he is enough. He is sufficient. The Apostle Paul in the, in the New Testament writes of this in Philippians chapter 3. He says, all the stuff that this world holds near and dear, all the money and the titles and the accomplishments and the morality and the good life that I thought I was living, that counts nothing to me now compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus. Jesus is enough. He is sufficient. The reason that New Testament book of Matthew, Gospel of Matthew reminds us that Jesus was called Emmanuel. God with us. The presence of the all-sufficient, all-powerful, all-glorious God come to us, to be with us. And he is enough. He is sufficient. It's better to have Jesus with nothing else. No material goods. No relationships even. Nothing that this world prizes. It's better to have Jesus and nothing else than to have everything else that this world offers but not to have Jesus. Sometimes the world looks like an unfair place. Sometimes... Our feet are tempted to slip down and fall. When you make assumptions about how the world should operate, you make assumptions about how God should operate, your feet will, sl will stumble and fall. The gospel proves to us that God doesn't always work in the way that we think he will. Goodness, look at the Christmas story. Who would ever thought a Savior comes and is born in a manger, raised in a small town? God has come. Have you encountered the presence of God? Have you had an encounter with God that changes your life? When you do, you see that God deals with evil. God won't let it go unchecked. You'll see that life is about eternity and not about temporality, and you'll see that God is enough. Let's pray. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we do worship you. We don't always understand your ways. We don't always understand the way that the world works. And indeed, sometimes to us, the world does look like an unfair place. It does look like sin and evil can win the day while the righteous struggle just to get by. But Lord, the gospel proves all of those assumptions completely wrong. The gospel shows us that you have come to deal with evil but also that you've made a way for pardon and mercy. And so, Lord, help us to keep our eyes fixed and focused on Jesus.
We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>